As Singapore's leader, he reflects on his country's unique development model. To tackle epoch-making transformations, he believes in advancing with the times and remaining true to our original aspirations. He embraces multilateral cooperation and praises the Belt and Road Initiative as a popular win-win model. In this edition of Leaders Talk, we meet Li Xian Wong, Prime Minister of Singapore. Hello and welcome to Leaders Talk, where we meet leaders, thinkers and trailblazers. I'm Zhou Yun. We are currently in Singapore, known as the Garden Country, and we're here to interview our guest, Mr. Lee Sien Long, Prime Minister of Singapore. He once said that Singapore depends on globalization to make a living, but its globalization now faces strong headwinds. What are his new plans for the country for its future development? And what are his new visions and thoughts on enhancing the all-round cooperative partnership between Singapore and China? Today, we're going to talk to Mr. Lee Sien Long, Prime Minister of Singapore. Your Excellency, Prime Minister, thank you so much for joining us today. China's two sessions, the political season, has been successfully concluded not long ago, and uh, you have sent congratulatory letters to Chinese leaders. So what do you think is the significance of this year's two sessions? Well, uh, very importantly, you've settled the leadership team for the next five years. And I've written to President Xi to congratulate him on his re-election, and Premier Li Qiang to congratulate him on his election. For China, uh, your two sessions are very important occasions for setting the agenda and debating the direction of the country. And I think uh, the direction has been quite clearly uh, defined in the speeches and the statements and the interviews which the leaders have given. And we look forward to China implementing this and. Uh, continuing to prosper and continuing to develop good, mutually beneficial relations uh, with the rest of the world generally, but especially with Asia and, of course, with Singapore. Uh -huh, of course. When you met with Chinese President Xi Jinping last year in Bangkok, yes. President Xi described this bilateral relations between China and Singapore as um, forward-looking, strategic and exemplary. And he also emphasized that high quality should be the hallmark of this bilateral cooperation. So, Mr. Prime Minister, how would you define the bilateral relations between the two countries? And also, how do you think this very distinctive feature of high quality can be pursued and brought forward? Well, I think we have very good relations. They are broad and encompass many fields. And we have been working together for many years. I mean, you look at our, uh, our we established diplomatic relations was 1990, so that's 33 years ago. But in fact, we had cooperation for many years even before that. So we know each other well. Um, I think that there's trust and mutual understanding uh, we have our different perspectives on issues, but we work with one another. And we have been able to get very substantive projects going. Uh, we have what we call government-to-government -government projects. The first one was the Suzhou Industrial Park, Suzhou Gong Yuan. That's celebrating 30th anniversary next year. Uh, and it's been a very successful project. In fact, it has been ranked the best economic development zone in China now seven years running. So it has uh, amply fulfilled the hopes we had when we launched the project. Uh, then we had the Tianjin uh, Eco City, Tianjin Gong, Tianjin Sheng Tai Cheng, uh, which I think you have visited. <laughs> yes, as a very first story um, as a journalist when I started working. Yes, I think that was some years ago. It's fulfilling a role demonstrating and trying out ways to make a city sustainable and, and eco-friendly, mm -hmm. which is uh, important for China and important also for the world. And the third um, G2G project is our Chongqing Connectivity Project, the Integrated Land Sea Transport Corridor, which takes goes from Chongqing into Guangxi and to Beipu Wan. And uh, that fits in with the Belt and Road Initiative and helps to provide a new link between the interior of China with the outside world. 
You have a link down the Yangtze River, down to Changjiang, but that's uh, some distance and also is very, very busy. So an additional link, shorter, faster, out to Southeast Asia and to the rest of the world, we think it makes significant contribution to the Belt and Road idea. So I think we have good projects. Uh, our private sector, of course, has very extensive cooperation too. Uh, also, we have specific things to do. For example, we have the FTA with China, which we have revised once before and is being reviewed again. We're having, having uh, subsequent negotiations, uh, which we hope we will be able to complete before too long. Since the establishment of diplomatic relations 33 years ago, China and Singapore have streamrolled all-out cooperation. The partnership with the Agency for Science, Technology and Research in Singapore being one example. At one of the agency's labs, there's a prototype of a technology, the first of its kind globally. This is a high-speed three-dimensional profilometer. It is a special type of microscope capable of detecting micron-scale defects in semiconductor chips. It used to take 30 hours to check the quality of semiconductor chips. But thanks to this profilometer, it only takes 30 milliseconds. Ninkanjiga 可以在线的检测系统的话,可以避免这种损失. Researchers here told us this technology is an innovation in the field of semiconductor production. In order for the technology to be mature and enter the market, other elements are needed. 中国有广阔的市场, 呃, 便于推广这样的一些技术, 中国还有一个优势就是它有完整的产业链. China as, a, as our launching launch to the world, and, and the beginning of our technology. It's a big market, everybody wants to be there. If I can compete in Chinese market, I can survive anywhere. The projects that you just mentioned, the uh, new international land situate corridor, yes. the uh, Suzhou Industrial Park, the Tianjin Eco City, actually those projects are now playing as uh, we're playing a demonstration role under the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. Actually, Singapore is the very first country among ASEAN members to publicly express the support for the Belt and Road Initiative. Yes. So, what has prompted this country to ex express its support at a very early age? Well, we supported it because we saw this as a good strategic move by China. China is growing, China is prospering, China's place in the world is becoming more important. The Belt and Road Initiative, we saw it as one way China could contribute to the development of the region and therefore integrate itself into the regional network of cooperation and interdependence and therefore be welcomed across the region in a win-win way. The region needs infrastructure, the infrastructure needs financing. China is capable of doing that or building infrastructure. It can also help to provide the financing. It can also develop the trade and economic links with the countries in the region and with the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, there's a framework within it which this can be done. Mm -hmm. With China within our region, the biggest economy, it's important that uh, we develop that relationship in an open and sustainable and I think mutually beneficial way. So we saw the Belt and Road Initiative from that light and therefore we decided that we should say, yes, it makes sense, we support it. And the other is, uh, what kind of opportunities do you think this initiative will usher in for not only Singapore, but also the region? From Singapore's point of view, what do we contribute to Belt and Road? Well, first, we are a financial centre, so it, uh, it could be one place where projects um, have financing and where projects can be evaluated, and, uh, and that's an important piece of the infrastructure, the soft infrastructure for the scheme. And in fact, Singapore is one of the uh, biggest 
trading centers for renminbi internationally. So that's one aspect of it. Then there's also the, the legal aspect of it, because we are a center for arbitration, mediation. Um, but there are many international law firms operate in Singapore. Um, countries on the Belt and Road schemes, if they are looking for places to arbitrate their issues or to find legal expertise, we can be one of the sources for these, uh, to meet these projects' needs. So that makes sense for us also. And I think thirdly, with, uh, in Singapore, many companies find us a convenient place to set up what they call control tower functions. Control tower functions. Control tower functions. What do you mean by that? That means their headquarters, their uh, fiscal management, their human resource management, their oversight of operations uh, in all around us, maybe sometimes over on a very big footprint throughout the region. And so if some of the companies would like to set up here and therefore from here be able to manage their operations in Southeast Asia better, uh, I think that's good for them and we are happy to have them. This is um, what you would call win-win, right? That's win-win. Mm -hmm. Well, turning back to bilateral cooperation, the digital economy is now becoming one of the new highlights for China-Singapore cooperation. And in November of 2021, China has uh, formally applied to join DIPA, Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, which was um, proposed by Singapore, New Zealand and Chile. Yeah, it, it's, we three of us form the DIPA right now. So what do you think is the significance of China's decision to join this mechanism? And how does Singapore see China's accession? I think the, uh, the digital economy is a very important new growth area for China, certainly because you have many uh, very successful digital companies now. And for other countries too, it is, uh, not, is a growth opportunity and it's therefore also an opportunity for countries to work together in the digital field, establish standards, become interoperable, be able to have the data flows across borders, um, freely and with suitable safeguards and all those require new rules so therefore the idea of a, a digital economy agreement is a kind of new age FDA. I think it's good for China to have an interest in DIPA because when we formed DIPA the idea was to have it designed to be open so that anybody can join who can meet the standards and will commit to meeting the standards. Mr. Prime Minister, let's talk a little bit about China-ASEAN relations, which now has entered fast lane. Well, remarkable progress has been made in the past years, with both sides becoming each other's largest trading partner, with trade volume increased uh, by about 100 times from 30 years ago, and with direct investment exceeding 310 billion US dollars, astounding, remarkable progress, right? And now both sides are pushing for a kind of um, upgrade for cooperation, which is known as version 3.0 for a trade agreement. So what role do you think Singapore could play in this process? Well, we are one member of ASEAN. There are 10 members. We are nearly the smallest. <laughs> so we have a modest conception of our role in ASEAN, but we will participate in it fully and uh, uh, try to help it um, to move forward. Uh, you ask how Singapore can help. Apart from participating in ASEAN, one of the ways we help is by uh, showing the potential of what can be done. So we have a Singapore-China FTA. I mean, it has, it has agreements and provisions, and there's an ASEAN-China FTA. And I think when you're negotiating with one country, it's not so complicated as negotiating with a group of 10. <laughs> right. And therefore, you can uh, go uh, faster and, um, uh, and further, but it shows what can be done. And therefore, it's an encouragement when working with ASEAN to say, look, it is possible. Singapore has done it. We found it good. China has found it workable. Why not think about it? And so that's one way in which Singapore can help to push the ASEAN-China cooperation forward. I think the ASEAN-China cooperation also depends on the overall economic cooperation, also depends on the overall relationship. Between, because between China and ASEAN, it's not just economic issues, but you also have uh, discussion on political issues and security issues, and there are some uh, pro problems which need to be worked upon. 
I mean, for example, we are discussing the code of conduct on the South China Sea. That's something which is not easy to, to, to work out, but we've been working on it and we hope to make further progress. Between ASEAN and China, the relations are good, but the more we can deal with the non-economic issues well, I think the more the economic relations can prosper. And it works the other way around too. If we can have good economic ties, I think there's more incentive for us to resolve the other problems. Mr. Prime Minister, let's shift gears a little bit and come back to Singapore. Yes. Well, people outside of Singapore always talk about its uh, unique model of development, and I know you would rather call it a kind of approach. So as the Prime Minister of Singapore, how do you think this country, which is a small island state with very limited resources, to not only survive, but also thrive? Well, first, we must know that we are a small country surrounded by much bigger countries, and will always be. Therefore, if we are conscious of that, uh, we have to make up for that. Make up for that by working more cohesively, by uh, being more creative, by making the most of our people, by running an efficient system, clean, uh, trusted, respected, and doing sensible things so that uh, we can create value not just for ourselves to make a living, but for other people to say, yes, Singapore has something to add. Let's work with Singapore and um, take advantage of this. And of course, we have to make friends with many countries because um, if you can have friends who make common cause with you on issues which are important to you and to them, well, that helps us not just economically, but in terms of our network and our position in the world. And within the country, we have to be able to work together and care for one another and understand that we are Singaporeans together. So whatever arguments we may have or differences, please remember that what keeps what, what we share in common is much more important. Mm -hmm. So it's, to me, it sounds like kind of unity, the unity within the country and also the very close ties or good relations with uh, other parts of the world. Yes, with our neighbours and with uh, major countries uh, and even small countries elsewhere. If you look at where our big markets are, you're talking about China, uh, Europe, America. But if you ask where, who are our friends, well, we have these are our friends. Many small countries are our friends too. Singapore has um, supported and participated in the Global Development Initiative, which is uh, proposed by China. So in which way do you think GDI could help in addressing the ongoing global challenges? We are a member of the Friends of GDI group. Uh, we think that the objectives of the GDI, which are consistent with the sustainable development goals of the UN, uh, are good ones. Uh, we think that they can be implemented in a way which is pragmatic, which is inclusive. Uh, which is open, and so uh, we are uh, in support of this, um, just as we are in support of other initiatives uh, and other groupings. Talking about China-Singapore relations, there's one person we have to mention is Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who is the founding prime minister of Singapore and also an old friend of Chinese people. Yes. In an exclusive interview with CCTV back in 2005, he said that China's um, growth and um, its uh, rise will bring strong impetus to Southeast Asia, yes. and he also said, quote unquote here, Singapore will perform the role of base to understand Southeast Asia. Mm. So now about 20 years later, as his son and also the um, Prime Minister of Singapore, how do you understand his words? Well, there's no doubt that China's rise has been an enormous benefit to Southeast Asia. Nearly every country in Southeast Asia has China as its biggest trading partner. Singapore does too. And that's a tremendous economic opportunity. Uh, Singapore has, I think, a disproportionate, pays disproportionate attention to this. And in the early years, I think we were perhaps moving faster than the others in developing the economic relationship. But as the other countries have um, established their links, so what is our role? Well, I think from, for, for your companies, there is a value in working with Singapore and through Singapore, managing your, their presence in Southeast Asia, as I explained just now with the uh, control tower functions and the headquarters activities. The financial activities through Singapore are significant. And also, I think Singapore, uh, we articulate more explicitly what it is which is at stake 
in developing the relationship with China and maintaining peace, stability, and prosperity in this part of the world. And we hope that by speaking up that way, uh, we can exercise some modest influence to encourage countries to think about the opportunities and the risks uh, in the international scene and work together to take advantage of one and mm -hmm. avoid the other. What vision do you have for the future of your country? Uh, we have built a country which has increasingly had a sense of nationhood and identity. It's prospered now for more than one generation. And what we would like to see is that it can continue to evolve and develop into the future, keeping up with the times, but at the same time maintaining the values and the instincts and the culture which have made us unique and made us successful. So that's quite hard. You have to keep up with what's happening, but at the same time, you must not uh, forget what made you, this place tick. We're still small, we're still vulnerable. We still have to work hard. Uh, we still need to make friends. And we still need to stay together as one Singapore. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, then Singapore will be successful. Lee Sien Long's father, Lee Kuan Yew, was the founding prime minister of Singapore. Under his leadership and since his founding in 1965, Singapore has become an important economic, financial, transport and petrochemical hub. Lee Kuan Yew once promoted Singapore's deep participation in the great process of China's reform and opening up. When he passed away in 2015, Chinese President Xi Jinping sent a message of condolences, calling him an old friend of the Chinese people and the founder, pioneer and promoter of China-Singapore relations. They are determined as a people to unify and build a modern, powerful, wealthy Chinese nation. And I say good luck to them. In Li Xianlong's memory, Li Kuan Yu observed China in detail and had a strong interest in China's development. Very early on, he foresaw the success of China's reform and opening up, as well as China's far-reaching influence in the world. In his youth, Li Xianlong graduated mathematics at the University of Cambridge. He went on to study computer science at the behest of his father. In his spare time, he shares his computer codes on social media and discusses equation solving with mathematicians. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, let's talk a little bit about yourself. Yes. I heard that you have great passion for mathematics. And for instance, when people like me, when we take on vacation, we relax and we have fun, right? But I heard when you take on vacation, you would spend some of your vacation time to look into unsolved mathematical problems. And that is depicted by some local media as revealing the geeky side of you every now and then. <laughs> Back in your days in Cambridge, some professors say they felt it was a pity for you to become a politician, not a uh, mathematician, because you were back then a rising star in the world of math. Mr. Prime Minister, have you ever regret about this choice? And how do you think your mastery of mathematics has influenced you in your approach of governance? I, I don't regret. I, I was not a rising star. I was a <laughs> promising student. <laughs> You're very uh, being modest no, here. I, it's a vast field, and I did two undergraduate years in mathematics, so. It's just a barely at the foothills. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed it. I was not bad at it, but there are many more talented and brilliant mathematicians in the world than me. And um, I decided that I had a responsibility to come back to Singapore and be part of Singapore and do what I could to help the country to succeed. It's a small country. It was at that time a very new country, mm -hmm. the first few years of independence. And every person who could make a difference should make a difference. And I thought I would like to do that and do my best. And I think that's the right thing to do. I, it's been a very fulfilling life. I've been in, first in the armed forces. Right. And then after that in government. And I've been in government now for nearly 40, 40 years. years. Yes. It's tremendously intellectually stimulating. 
Mm -hmm. because you deal with such a wide range of issues, some of them quantitative, you have to make your budgets balance. Which is you're good at all those numbers, right? Well, the more at, numbers, the never, more exciting but you get. <laughs> but then you see, it's never just numbers. Gotcha. You, the numbers have to work, but you must be able to make it work in terms of, in terms which people can understand and accept and want to see. Mm -hmm. How, what difference does it make to somebody's life? Uh, why does it matter to them? Why does it matter to us? Which ones should we go first? Mm -hmm. Is it more important to, to build more houses first? Is it more important to have less social impact from migrant workers mm -hmm. in the country? Is it more important to, um, um, to grow faster? Or maybe to pay more attention to social welfare issues and, and accept lower growth in order to have less pressure on the people? So these are very, these are often intangible, difficult to settle Issues difficult to settle permanently. Right. There are no permanent solutions. You cannot say, done, proven, QED, no. put aside, next problem. Uh -huh. These are Never issues, a check in there, not a full check in there. You, you cannot say, checked, done. These are issues which will come back over and over again, mm -hmm. year after year, in different forms. You solve it. It, come, it will, some other issue will take its place or this will come back in a different way. Mm -hmm. And China has the same situation. I mean, you, you solve the problem of country. poverty, right. then you have the question of inequality, you address that. Mm -hmm. But there's never any point where you can say, my job is done. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not only very passionate about mathematics, and also um, I think you not only believe in persistence and also by keeping an open mind. You also think hope sometimes is very well needed because in your National Day rally in 2021, you quoted a son. Chun Yen Li. Yes. And you even sung a little bit. Yes. No, no, I can't sing. <laughs> I know, I know, but you sound a little bit like Chun Tian Li, Bai Hua Xiang, Long Lig, Long Lig, Long Lig. But you, what you really care is about the scripts at the very end, right? Yes. It's, um, yes. Why did you decide to quote that specific line for that very Why did you decide to quote that specific line for that very special occasion? Because we were in COVID, we were coming out of COVID, uh, hadn't quite emerged from the tunnel yet, but there was in fact light in front of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was something which I should remind Singaporeans because you could see the light there, mm -hmm. and yet it was still necessary for the government to take some measures to, to keep things tight. Mm -hmm. And we could not relax our measures yet. And we needed to encourage people, hang on, the dawn is coming. So what about now? What do you think are urgently needed at this specific timing. There are new issues in the world post-COVID, and it, we, we are not able to take a holiday after COVID. <laughs> we have to come back, and the term has started again. We work again. So you don't have vacation time to, um, to look into some of the mathematical problems? Uh... I, take, I do take breaks from time to time, but uh, the mind can't completely switch off. <laughs> okay. Mr. Prime Minister, it was a great pleasure and honor talking to you, and we really appreciate for all the experiences, the insights, and also the stories that you shared with us today. Thank you. Thank Enjoyed you. it. Thank you so much. During our exclusive interview with Prime Minister Li Xianlong here, he touched upon a wide range of issues, including bilateral relations, regional cooperation, and global governance. He said, given the ever-changing global pattern around us, countries need to keep up with times to those new changes and stick to the traditional values, including friendship, mutual trust, respect, and cooperation. And we look forward to see China and Singapore continue to put its well-being of the people first and propel the regional prosperity. With that, I'm going to wrap up this edition of Leaders Talk. I'm Zhou Yun, reporting from Singapore. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.